really excited to have you on. Honestly, it's a, it's a real treat. Thank you. Um, I guess to kick it off, I want I want to start off because I want to talk about your your childhood a bit too in your early days because I know you mm -hmm. you got into the business in your in your thirties and before that you've always had this fondness for voice acting. I noticed because it was almost like an an escape for you to kind of get away from your problems when you were growing up. Like, yes. has there been any characters or projects that hold special significance for you due to the connection with your personal struggles? Um, they're all important to me um, because I'm a journeyman. You know, it's like everything is of equal importance. I mean, sometimes you do things that people think are are cool and amazing. And sometimes you're doing stuff because that's your job, you know, that you don't have a particular uh, emotional attachment to. But I try to keep it I try to keep a balance like I, I love everything that I get to do and I'm grateful for that. But I mean, the things <clears throat> the things that stick out are uh, Futurama, because I, I I feel fortunate that I was able to uh, be given the opportunity to express myself in so many ways on that show with the different characters. And, uh, you know, it's it's like um, it's so funny. All the characters have like mythological constructs when you think about it. Well, even like um, I noticed when when you see shows like even like Ren and Stimpy that you did, it kind of has. I it, I don't look at them as just cartoons. They have deeper meanings. They have things that I guess both adults and I guess kids, adolescents can relate to. Yes, I think an important thing. Well, that's an old fashioned thing. When I was growing up, there was Rocky and Bullwinkle, and there was stuff that kids would totally get and understand. But if there were adults sitting there too, you'd see them cracking up at something that didn't make sense to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was kind of, it covered the spectrum. It was for everybody, you know? Yeah, I was watching, well, my one of my shows growing up when I was a kid, before I got into Futurama, I got into Futurama when I was like, I think 11 or 12. But before that, I used to watch like Spongebob. And even like the innuendos in that, like there's one where Spongebob goes to Gary. It was like, oh, um... Like, oh, it's a soap. Don't drop it. And it's like, when you're a kid, you think, oh, don't, don't drop. What's that mean, right? And you get older, you go, don't drop the soap. Oh, okay. So it's like one of those. You know what? I don't think in the history of prisons, anyone's ever dropped the soap and something happened to them. I know. Where does that, but where does that, yeah, where did that whole thing come from? I don't know. Because I never. It's, it's, it's the stupidest thing. I mean, I have to admit one time when I was in trouble many, many years ago, I was a drinker and a drugger and I was a real problem. This is like beyond 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I wound up, I I wrecked a car and I, and it was a DUI and I had to go to court <clears throat> and the judge just, you know, conked me over the head really and sent me to uh, jail for two weeks. I was in the Charles Street Jail, which is in Boston. It was a pissy, smelly 200, 300 year old Bastille. And, uh, it's it's condos now. It's it's apartments. I should get one. Yeah, I know. Get, find my old exactly cell, the, old, you know? the old stomping ground. <laughs> um, but but on a hot summer night, I'll bet you anything. If you smell, you can still smell three hundred year old urine. Oh, <laughs> that's disgusting. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's just you can't get it out. I think. But um, but anyway, um, when I was in there, I um. You know, I, I said to myself, God, I got to straighten out and I got to, um, you know, turn my life around. Um, and, you know, it was a real wake up call. So when I got out of there, I started getting real serious. Um, I was already doing radio. And um, let's see. Um, yeah, I was in radio in Boston. And, you know, that was escape. It really was um, being able to do characters and, and write my own bits and everything and um and then i moved to new york and i was working with the howard stern show that's really cool yeah i know you've done so many awesome things even like uh, i noticed what was really interesting too i saw you've been collabing with uh jim cummings who's a phenomenal voice actor too want to shout him out and uh, just oh sure he's yeah. he's uh he's unbelievable and uh he you know he and guys like him always inspired me and they happen to be my friends um, when I'll tell you the truth, whenever I go to a gig and there's, you know, heavyweights in the room, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I gotta, I gotta really be on my toes today, you know, uh, 
I think the same tide raises all boats. You know, if you work with good people, you'll stay good. Yeah, for sure. And, I, and I'm sure you get to like pick each other's brains and understand like their process and how maybe you can take something from them. They, they, they could take something from you. And that's all collaborative effort forms, I think, too. Yeah, the work speaks for itself, though. You, you know, you can take what you want from it, whether you're a, whether you're a fan or in the audience or if you're a collaborator or a co-worker. I take a lot from that. There's a mm -hmm. there's a, an immense energy working with other people. I mean, because during the pandemic, a lot of us had to work solo and they had yeah. to edit everything together. Um, but but working <clears throat> in concert with others is it's my favorite thing. Because of the energy, you know, everybody comes in the door ready to, to work. And then if there's like any kind of breaks or pauses, you know, we immediately start talking about what's going on in the news and riffing on it. And, you know, it it, it turns out it it turns into like Robin Williams and Jim Carrey. You know what I mean? Oh. And then it's time to stop and go back to work. Yeah. Well, speaking of Robin Williams, who is like one of the greatest to ever do it. And anything he's done, drama, <laughs> comedy, voiceover, everything. There was a funny thing I read, speaking of Robin Williams, was that Mrs. Doubtfire, they had about, I believe it was like an extra hour of unused footage because he just kept going off the rails and like improvising and doing all these oh, things. Sure. And plus, he, they also have like an R-rated, PG-13, and a G-rated style of film because that's how much he was able to give them. So I, th I think that's just hilarious how he can do yeah, that. Yeah, he was... Um... He was just amazing. Um, you know, I I didn't grow up watching him. I was a young guy and I was playing in bands and mm -hmm. um but but there was somebody who inspired him. He idolized Jonathan Winters and I was a Jonathan Winters uh devotee. This guy was like, you know, he was the Robin Williams of his time. And then there was another guy um named Sid Caesar. Who one did dialects and 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 characters and and it fractured me when I was a little kid. I mean, I saw that that was the first televised image I ever saw was Sid Caesar on television, and my mom let me stay up to watch this show, and I took it all in, every bit of it, you know, the sketches, everything. And I was very young; I was about five. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I grew up because my, because my dad showed me. I wasn't like around when they were in their prime obviously but like rodney dangerfield and don rickles i guess those the, the, for the older comics that's who i know. yes yes but, yeah um they were they were superlatives you know did you ever see the movie uh midnight in paris you know it sounds with, so familiar uh, who's who's in that movie with uh, um oh gosh what's his name uh, the blonde actor he's got kind of a weird nose let me see min oh Owen, i was gonna say owen wilson <laughs> yeah owen wilson Oh, it is him. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is Owen Wilson. I just searched it. Oh my god! He crazy. always plays the part of a guy with a weird nose. Wow. <laughs> but but anyway, um, that movie, if you watch it, explains something that I was never able to put my finger on, and Woody Allen figured it out. He um, every night at midnight in this particular area on a street in Paris, this this old like old Rolls Royce sort of taxi or something would come down the street and they'd have the door open and Owen Wilson would get in and inside were like the heroes of their different generations. Yeah. And yeah, there was Louis Bunel and, um, you know, Francois Truffaut, not him. There was one guy before him, uh, Louis Mal. Okay. And then there was uh, Ger Gertrude Stein and then there was Hemingway and, uh, you know, and, and you find out that, you know, every generation looks at the previous generation and go, why was everything so goddamn good? You know, how come everything just dissipated and all that beautiful stuff doesn't exist anymore because no one can do it? The thing is, is you will be the idol of a, of, of a following generation. All the stuff you did and all the stuff that happened in your time will be the new standard to them. Yeah, I always think it like that because I always... Maybe I consider myself an old soul. You could probably tell by all the memorabilia stuff I have in my yes. studio room. But it's like, I always think, and I, I wasn't even around for the 80s or the 90s. I, I, I was born in 1999, but I always consider myself an old soul. I always think like back then it was times were simpler, easier, happier, and yes. better. But it's kind of like what you said. I think down the road, 
let's say in the next 20 years, my kids will look back on when I grew up and said, oh, dad, you lived in the best era. Oh, wow. When you guys had they this. They will say that. That's what it is. You're right. And I, I have to kind of have that more mentality. Otherwise, it's going to be just depressing if I just keep thinking like now it's not the best time. Well, well, the younger people coming up have the luxury of being able to watch YouTube and watch stuff that happens decades before them. Yeah. And um, and I and I'll go on like um, I'll Beach Boys were heroes of mine, musical heroes. Love Brian Beach Wilson. Boys. Oh, yeah. I love Beach Brian Boys. Wilson particularly was one of my idols. And, uh, you know, these young people go on YouTube and they look at these old um videos of, with songs and the clips of the band and stuff. And the comments are always, how come we got gypped? Why isn't music like this anymore? How come there's no feeling anymore? It's just boom, 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 boom. And uh, they, they feel like they got cheated. They and, do. Uh, in a way they did because the state of music is really weird now, you know, it's different. Like, I mean, there's, yeah, there's some things that like, I think, having that that actually have gotten worse over time right like movies for example i personally think i think we're in a weird i wouldn't say we're in a bad state i just think we're in a weird state for movies right now there's like a like a24 the production company i'm not sure if you know them but like they're they make amazing independent movies and i love all of them like mm -hmm. they're so unique and diverse but then it's like you have some that are just it feels like in my opinion, we're just using the, the same idea that's like this, you know, part two, part three, part four of the same thing. And, and it's kind of ruining that. My thing is people think that let's say you have a good movie, like let's say Rush Hour, right? I think they're making another Rush Hour, right? Rush Hour, you, all three were good, but the first is always going to be the best in my opinion. And it's like, that was something so special. And, and I feel like they're trying to, they keep trying to get that same magic with yes. doing the sequels, but they're not going to do that. So they have to kind of think, well, think outside the box more. That's 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 the ultimate lesson of anybody that has to try and do anything in Hollywood is that the minute they find a formula, you know, they think everything's a formula that they can just co-opt. You know, they see the success of something else and they go, now we're going to do our version of it. And, and then if it was a success, they do a second version of it and a third and they just keep going until people are like, OK, already enough, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those things. But even with Futurama, for example, when you first did that show, did you think, because I know we were talking about how when you do something, people in the future will look back on it and think, oh, that was amazing. That was so good. When you first did that show, did you think it was going to have that long standing impact that it has today? Because it's been so long and it's still so popular. You never know when you're in the middle of doing something, you know, mm -hmm. whether it was 30 years ago or, or 15 years ago, when you're in the middle of... <clears throat> working on something and recording it, you have no idea how it's going to be perceived by people. Mm -hmm. You know, you have no idea that you're, you're participating in what will become a cultural phenomenon uh, or a cult thing. You, you really can't know that until, until it comes out and then people kind of define it for you, you know, and they define you. They say, you know, they'll describe your acting or your voiceovers or something. And, and, uh, you know, it's it's kind of up to them what to call you. You know, so, some people will call somebody a genius and, and and other people will be like, eh, pass, you know. That's what makes it so fun and, and riveting, this job, is because you do things and it has that, you get that rush of that knowing that, like, will it be good? Will it be not? Like, will it not be good? And will it be a success or a failure? But that's the rush you get. And that's what... That's what makes you want to give it your all and do the best you can do. And that, and hopefully people can resonate. I've resonated with the show and millions of people have. So it's obviously literally my, one of my favorite shows. And I actually, I don't know if this is true. I thought Thanks. it was funny. No problem. Did you, did you audition for the role of Bender as well? Or I don't know if yes. I, I read. Yeah. So I read that and I thought that was so interesting. What, what does voice sound like if you were Bender? Would, did you have like an um, idea? Like, what would that be like? It, it was nothing compared to what John uh, brought to the table. It, I I just thought of Bender, you know, because they said he was a robot that bends things. That was his job, you know. And, mm. and I thought he would be like a surly construction worker or something. You know, and the the voice was, you know, it was a contrivance. It, it wasn't like I had a handle on that character. The other ones came easy, naturally to me. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
But the Bender one was like a construction worker, like, you guys take that pipe and bring it over here and dig that hole. Ah. You know? But I mean, there was nothing special about that voice because it could have been anybody. But but John, you know, um, he he had a little formula of what he was going for in his head and it worked. It clicked. Yeah. When I was watching it when I was a kid, I never realized that you did uh, voices of um, like the for, for, okay, I, I, I always knew you did Fry and uh, Professor Farnsworth, but I never knew mm -hmm. you did Zoidberg and Zap Brannigan. Like those voices to me, my I think personally my favorite one you do they're all great, but I think Zoidberg is probably the most he he's just the funniest character because he always manages <laughs> he always manages to get like the shit end of the stick you know he's always like poor yes guy. you go oh come on poor guy well, you know it, it sort of underscores that he's a loser but it but he's his heart however many he has are is in the right <laughs> place that, that was good that's a good one how many hearts he has. Yeah, but I mean, it's in the right place. And, um, you know, and Fry's the same way. It's like he's all over the place and he's needy and um, whiny and complainy, which was what I was when I was 25. And that's why I did the voice the way I did. That's how I sounded. You know, I was in a band. Oh, man, I broke a string. Now what am I going to do? <laughs> that's so you funny. Know, and, yeah. yeah. And so that's what became uh, Fry. But but Zoidberg... Um, I I am an old soul too, and the, and stuff that happened before I was born, I was riveted by. And there were a couple of people. There was one guy named George Jessel. He was an old comedian back in the '30s and '40s. He was around, and um, and he had kind of a marble mouth. You know, he would say, uh, "You know the definition of a smart ass? A fellow that can sit on an ice cream cone and tell you what flavor it is." <laughs> And uh, and then there was another actor named Lou Jacoby from uh, Yiddish Theater, and he was the one in the movie Arthur that leaned into Dudley Moore and went, "What's it like to have all that money?" <laughs> and uh, you know, and so it's a combination of the two of them, because Zoidberg had all that stuff hanging off his face. I said, "Something's got to happen with that," you know. He says, "It can't go for naught. It can't be wasted. That 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 attribute." And so the speech would be affected, I think. Yeah. Well, no, it, it's it's funny. The, the way you even come up with like the process of like merging those two voices and putting it together. These are things that like professional artists do, such as yourself. It's like you think of other voice actors that it like who knows if they even do that the whole process. They may just think of just a, an, a silly idea that might work, but how you yes. go into like things that you resonated with that how you're an old soul you you got inspiration from these two characters and you put it together but it still sounds like a completely different thing that's where the magic happens yes and um with zap brannigan um i've spent a lot of time in radio in boston and in new york and um uh there were still some of the old guys still around i used to call them big dumb announcers <laughs> yeah um you know they were they were like, you know, well, it's five minutes past the big hour of five o'clock. And uh, let's see, we're on the downside of um, the traffic. And I guess we have to take a look at it. And, uh, you know, and I said, who talks like that? And and I can do it. But I always thought it was rather silly and, and sort of pretentious and pompous. And then I thought, oh, and there were, were uh, announcers that would belabor their words. They go. Well, as I look out the window, eh, yeah, you know, yeah, they do that. Yeah, I noticed that. Yep. Yeah, and and it's like the hamburger helper of words. It's just to buy time when you haven't got anything to say. So, um, so I thought that would be very funny for Zap Brannigan, and that's kind of the way what Phil Hartman would have done because I met him, um, and we shared our love of those big dumb announcers. He was very much into that, and uh, you know, so. <clears throat> That became Zap. I thought it was. They described him as, as as if William Shatner ran the Enterprise and not Captain Kirk. That is golden. That is golden. Yeah. It, it, no, it's awesome, man. And even like another big show I mentioned even earlier in the episode about Ren and Stimpy, which to me was always like a controversial show, but in a good way. Like I found it broke it broke boundaries. It, it was a really unique show. And but I want to know, like, were there ever moments during production where you felt that the show push, pushed boundaries? And, like, how did you ever navigate those challenges? I um, I was originally – here's the story. I I, um, 
I originally auditioned for both characters and um and they gave they sent me a tape so I could base some stuff on that and it's like it was uh, little clips of Peter Laurie and little clips of um that actor Burl Ives and that and Kirk Douglas and you know like swatches of it and and they wanted John Chris Lucy wanted me to incorporate these things into the character and um so I remember auditioning for it and you know I didn't get anything for real I just thought well I'll I'll just keep you know auditioning if that's what they want and uh but then um me and uh John K went to Nickelodeon went to uh MTV offices we went up there and and he didn't have a tape to play for the ladies at Nickelodeon that were going to decide whether they're going to put the show on or buy it or whatever and so we were in a closet literally this was right out of the movies um there was a mop you know and the handle of it um was sticking up and we had to fix a mic to it and I had a tape recorder and um and I had some scriptage and and I'm going through it and I'm reading both voices and he went in there for about half an hour 40 minutes or so and he came out and he said congratulations what you did um just uh, sold the show and I said well that's great and then he decided he wanted to do the Ren voice I think he had planned to do it all along but but he somehow forgot that um you know that he was using my audition tapes but but it doesn't matter you know it doesn't matter it's like the show went on and um yeah. I thought the characters were really really resonant I thought it was special I didn't even know what they were when I first looked at them I said what are they microbes or mosquitoes <laughs> well, I don't even know and uh and and it turned out to be a, a an asthma hound chihuahua all wound up wound tight um easy to anger you know yeah uh, narcissistic there's all kinds of stuff going on there and uh and stimpy was kind of simple and um the voice i used for him was the three stooges were my my heroes you know i stopped going to church when i discovered the three stooges <laughs> they were they were my saints you know yeah literally so, so funny so larry from the three stooges the little that he did i found riveting fascinating you know, he would just say stuff like, you know, hey, Mo, there's too much chismo in the tree, you know, and 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 people would hear that voice and they would know it. But they where the F does that come from? And it was from the Stooges. And I throw the three Stooges into everything I do. Even Zoidberg goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's from the three Stooges. That's from 1930s. I didn't, you know, realize, that. I didn't go, realize that. Oh, sure, sure. Watch old three stooges with curly when he runs away he's like <laughs> <laughs> and um you know i mean everything like you said comes from something and um and it and it depends on how you configure it or I'm how you you know how you uh, fuse different elements together and come up with with something that sounds original um which is hard to do it's hard to do to not sound derivative um but but you put your heart and soul into something and and um you try to give it life you try to make it more than two-dimensional cartoon you know you wanted it to to pop like make it you know it's like i've heard people talk about futurama and they say the characters feel like friends to them or people that they really could know in real life yeah. you know and and that's a great compliment because it means that they've become real to them. Well, yeah, and that was that was yeah. that was the idea. Yeah, it's not your typical show, like like you said, like not even just that the characters would, would be two dimensional, but the show doesn't feel two dimensional. It has life and meaning, and I think besides the comedy, there is that like where people can actually relate to on, like, on a deeper level with like some of the meanings and the themes behind it, which I think mm -hmm. I think shows like even like the Simpsons, Simpsons of Futurama, I think kind of pioneered pioneered that for other ones to come later on in the, in like well, the 2000s that's, and stuff right that's that's the matt matt graining um his his standards you know of what he saw and what mm -hmm. and what he felt in his head before things were created 
he he found a way to express it to the artists and the writers and um you know it's 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 him it's he's really got that that sensibility and and uh and he's very very funny you know mm-hmm. he's he's really funny and the writers um you know they're inspired by him and he oversees stuff but he's always pleasantly surprised at what they come up with believe me he loves them um he loves the cast you know he's he said it um he he just marvels you know and i and that makes me really really happy to make somebody like him happy because you know it's like people go yeah you created this and you created i didn't create shit <laughs> and that graining created all those things and and he created thousands of characters i can't even come close to that you know um but but i'm there to voice stuff give life to um things that were ideas and now they're real for sure even a guy like mel mel blank for example right who is obviously a, a you know he was a legend and he did so many cool things and um he was also a guy too to kind of pioneer the voice acting and bringing those characters to life as well oh, sure but you also got to voice some of the characters that he did, like Bugs Bunny, for example, and Space Jam. So, like, I guess I want to know, like, how do you, how do you honor his original performance, but also kind of give that n- new life as well? What do you kind of do to give it your own take? Well, first of all, I get to work with Michael Jordan, the <laughs> closest thing to a religious figure that we have. <laughs> <laughs> Um, classic. I just was going by everything that I saw as a kid, everything I grew up with. Um, there was only three channels when I was growing up and everything was in black and white. And, and, um, you had these old television sets, but when they showed a Warner brothers cartoon and believe me, they were shitty prints. There was nothing 4k didn't exist. It's like, it, it was a film of a film of another film Mm -hmm. copies. And they lost a generation every time. So by the time you saw it, it was just like dreadful. But it didn't matter because it was a cartoon and it was cool. And you could hear those beautiful voices and characterizations that he came up with. Um, So that knocked me for a loop when I was a kid. I had a really awful childhood. And that was one of the joys in life was gravitating towards something I could count on. Mm-hmm. You know, knowing it that it'll be great, it'll be cool if I see this. I already know it's gonna, you know, set me on fire. Bugs Bunny to me, I think, is one of the most iconic cartoon characters of all time, too. So I guess for you, yes. to play someone like that, it must have been such an honor just to even take that character and give you life as well, give it your own. It, it was, it was surreal, <laughs> but I did audition for it a, a few times and. um and I got the part and I and I thought, wow, I'm just going to do the best I can. I'm going to, you know, you have to pick a certain bugs from a certain era, which mm-hmm. one you're going to do. And we arrived at, at one that was sort of like from the the late 50s or 1958 when they were doing still doing those cartoons. Um, nobody could replace Mel Blanc, really. I mean, as far as like how he created those voices. Every one of them, every one of those characters can act. And that's an important thing about doing voice uh, characterizations. You have to be able to to know how to how, what to do with them, how how to uh, move them around and place them and and interpret them and you got to you got to understand how acting works. There's a whole formula to You know, cuz you want it you want it to ring true and people people are very savvy, you know, they smell bullshit and you know, they when it doesn't ring true, they know it right away. Absolutely, so you gotta you gotta keep uh, pushing the bar higher, in my estimation. Yeah, and I noticed like I've talked to a few other voice actors as well, and like the like the, to hear your process, to hear how passionate you are to raise the bar, it shows how much you care about the audience. First off, and shows how committed you are to your craft. But like you've been very vocal about how you feel about celebrities voice acting in cartoons as opposed to traditional voice actors. But what do you think distinguishes traditional voice actors and celebrities bringing cartoons to life, essentially? Um, I think it's again, it's a Hollywood thing. You know, the executives think they have a formula because you take a successful actor and you stick them behind a microphone doing a character for a cartoon. Um 
you know, in that situation, two and two doesn't necessarily equal four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes two and two equals one. Um, it, it's, it's not, it's not a fine science. Like, you know, okay, we'll have this successful person. Therefore what they do for us will be successful. Um, that's the thinking. Um, I think a lot of celebrities luck out and come up with something that, you know, uh, is, is passable. Sometimes there's, um, sometimes there's people that are excellent because that's, they understand how characters work. You don't, you know, you, you I guess you have the, uh, the privilege of being able to do who and what you are for a character, which to me is like, uh, a fool's errand, you know, because what, why are you, you know, why are you even doing it if you can't create something? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, I guess, um, I don't know. I, I thought that these people want, believe me, they wanted nothing to do with cartoons years ago. It was so beneath them to do animation, television, animation, bah, you know, movies, animated movies, bah, you know, yeah they were so above it and and then all of a sudden they were being offered s fortunes to come in and do like you know all told 10 or, eight or 12 hours worth of work and and get paid um you know some stratospheric amount of money and then suddenly they all wanted to do it of course yeah and and a lot of them just did it you know they claim that you know well i wanted to you know why'd you do the cartoon and I, well you know i wanted to, my kid you know to to see it i wanted to be a hero to him and and that's bullshit you know you did it for this unbelievable amount of money <laughs> Cause they, well because yeah i you know i i heard it pays very well like when you do big blockbuster animation movies right like it pays very well so I think it's what you said though before, right? People can smell bullshit, right? Like I think people, when they see a non like a, a non-traditional voice actor voice something and it's not that good, you could tell it's not bringing meaning. It's not bringing the character to life. People can tell. I can tell. Like if I'm watching someone, I go, yeah, it just sounds like the regular person, like the regular person, whoever's doing it. And there's no, yep. oomph. I guess that's the word. I don't know how to like put into words, but you get what I well, mean. Well, um, I always compared it to... Um what I believed alchemy to be is something has to change into something else. Otherwise there's no magic. You know, the producers used to sit at the table when you walked in the room and they, they'd say, look at this table. You see what's on here. There's a big lead bar and we'd love it. If you could turn it to gold before you leave and you would go, you know, and, uh, and there it would be, you turn something that was lead into gold and something changed. It was alchemy, and that's what created resonance and magic. Um, when a celebrity comes in, they see the lead bar on the table, and they walk by, and they goes, "Where's my twenty million dollars? And uh, where's the microphone?" It's true. You no, know, I, yeah, you could you could have said it better, man. You know, so but just know that like people can tell that people like yourself and Jim Cummings, for example, because he's uh, again really good. I, I admire him as well. People like oh, so do I. we, we know that you guys are the ones and many others out there, but I'm saying the ones that I personally like, no, it's, I think people yeah. nowadays understand it way more than they used to. There was no interest in people who did cartoon voices, except for a little, you know, cognoscenti, a little group of people that were hip enough to know who did what and were into it. And yep. then all of a sudden, you know, the world opened up because of the Internet and you can find out anything about anything. And uh, and people began to realize, hey, wait a minute, there's something special going on. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and I'm and I'm glad for that. I'm yeah. glad for that. And yeah, you should, man. It, it inspired. It's inspired. I, I meet thousands of people. Honest to God, I go to all the conventions, you know, the Comic Cons. Because yeah, yeah, I yeah. love doing them. I love talking to everybody. I love um, meeting everyone and showing my appreciation uh, for them. Uh, I'm honored that, you know, they, they have time in their life to follow something that I did. You know, I mean, I, it, it's like a mind blower. So, um, you know, I always feel like with every performance, you, you got to know, I, I hope this is a ringer. You know, I hope that people just take it that way. And, and I didn't do starring roles 
in um, Disenchantment, which was Matt Groening's other show that was uh, on Netflix. Um, but the ones that I did, I tried to make them just stick out, you know, like uh, uh, th there was this dopey cat that was hanging around the castle and he had a crown on and he was always looking for something to eat and he was always, you know, making little remarks, you know, like they were sarcastic remarks, but they were goofy. Yeah. And uh, and I did uh, it was Hanna-Barbera inspired, you know, the cat was like, well, look, uh, here's how I feel. OK, like, uh, you know. And, uh, and then there was this jester that would tell a joke and they'd throw him out the window or, or trap door him, you know, under the floor. And he'd be like, oh, no, <laughs> you know, that that's old school that yeah. stuff. Bring back the old school vibes, man. I'm telling you that that's what we need right now. I love it, you know. But yeah, I but think, you yeah. you you are you know you're you're supposed to be a hybrid of all the things that went into your blender, your and percolated in your head, and how you reinterpret all that passion and uh, sense of uh, fearlessness and adventure, wanting to to bring something to the table so bad that. Um, you know, I think it, it resonates. For sure. For sure. Uh, my last question for you, actually, it's kind of funny because I, I remember when I, was like, when I was watching an interview and I heard your real voice, I was like, you know what? I got to ask him about this. Has anyone ever told you that your normal voice has a strong resemblance to Marty McFly? Yes. <laughs> really? Okay, um, there you go. I knew it. Yeah, people have said that. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a compliment, by the way. It's a compliment. Um, yeah, I didn't realize it, you know, but I, but I was doing like, I try to keep it as, um, minimally charactery, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's like, I didn't play it over the top. I, I was going off of Matt Groening's, um, you know, idea of what the character should be. And he was like, he let me just do what came, you know, what happened in my gut the day I saw the character. And I wasn't even supposed to do it. I didn't know that I was going to audition for that. Mm -hmm. And um, so they said, want to try this? And I said, yeah, I'll try anything you have. And um, I didn't realize because the Fry voice is understated compared to the rest of them. The The other voices are are more over the top. Yeah. Like you distinct. Know, they're, they're very they're, distinct. Yeah. Like you could tell them apart. Yeah. They're exaggerations. There's nothing subtle Mm -hmm. But Fry has a subtle voice compared to the rest of them. Yeah, for sure. Because you know, even even like Nixon, I mean, you know, the, the Nixon character, I mean, I don't sound anything like Richard Nixon. <laughs> I mean, I could, but I thought, well, and then what would happen? Then what, you know? Yeah. What, yes. what would be funny about it? Nothing. Yeah. So I thought um, if he growled and, you know, made noises and, and that he was secretly like a mad dog or something um, all going on in this little head. Arrow! You know, yeah. so um, so I because I grew up and he was president. I was a young man and I got drafted. And oh, um, okay. I, didn't, I didn't know that I was drafted in 1970 and um, I had the flattest feet in the world. And um, and I had high blood pressure. I was, um, I don't know. I was a stressed out young person mm -hmm. and, uh, but I didn't, I wasn't drafted. Um, but, uh, where that characterization basically comes from is, um, uh, Larry Talbot, Lon Chaney Jr., the Wolfman. Okay. Um, in, in the universal horror films from the forties. Yeah. Uh, yeah Lon I Chaney Jr. You know, it'd strike a certain hour and he would go, I want you to lock me in this room and don't open the door. No matter what you hear, no matter what goes on in there, don't open the door because he started turning into a werewolf. Mm -hmm. And so in 1961 or two, I forget what year exactly. My mom and me were watching the debate presidential debate between Nixon and Kennedy mm -hmm. and, uh, and Kennedy just looked like a game show host. You know, he looked like a million bucks. He, he was like, they shot him and, in in like a beautiful uh light and and then the kennedy's people told the camera people to do extreme close-ups of nixon 
you know, where you could see the pores in his nose and the hair growing on his face and the sweat and the ick. And um, he was a mess. He was a mess. He was like, rah, 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 rah. I want to be president. <laughs> I want to be president of the United States because, uh, rah, rah, rah. you know, I'm exaggerating. But but I said to my mom, I said, Mom, he, he looks like he's going to turn into a werewolf or something. <laughs> and so so I thought of him that way whenever I, you know, was asked to to interpret Nixon. I mean, not not, not as full as I did for Futurama, but. Um, he, I want to be president of the United States because, uh, well, because uh, I rule. I rule. I rule. <laughs> you know, and uh, and that's what made it funny. That's what made it resonate and pop. Because, yeah. you know, if you if you just sounded like Nixon, it, it would have been nothing. Well, yeah, but I think what's funny about this is that people actually, when when you hear, okay, how does Nixon sound like? People think of your rendition in Futurama more I than know. actual Richard Nixon. I'm serious. I that, know. That's how iconic it's become. Everybody get out. You know, I mean, yeah, I just thought of him as an angry, like, alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, so but but it's like how you hear something or, or what your mind, where your mind goes with it, like, what if he did this? It's it's a real what if when you're when you're trying to do a character that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. You go something something can't stack right. It's it's got something's got to be uneven or jagged because that's where comedy comes from. It's like you're pushing against what's comfortable and and um, you know what's normal. Otherwise, there's no comedy element. Well, yeah, you gotta, yeah, yeah, you gotta, you gotta step outside the box. You gotta do things that are, yes. are uncomfortable because if you do things that are comfortable, people are not gonna laugh. People are not gonna find it funny, and there's no originality to it. That's why but, I feel like I mean, comedy is in that space. Yeah, yeah, but I remember one time, excuse me, a couple of the writers, um, they said, you know, when you're doing Nixon, why do you put this, you know, Aru in it? And I said, you don't like that? And they go, no, no, we love it. We just don't know why you do it. And I explained the whole story to them. But but they loved it regardless, not even knowing it because it sounded funny to them. Yeah, you got to trust your gut too and do what you think is best. You know, and that's why. Yeah, and that's why. Otherwise, we wouldn't have yeah. got that performance. We wouldn't have got that performance from you otherwise if you just kind of like <laughs> listen to other people and go like, ah, should I do this? Should I not do this? You, there would be no spark to it, right? So yes, yeah, yes. And the professor, um, he was an amalgam, a combination of doddering wizards and mad scientists and magicians, and you know, all were kind of rolled into one. And he was one hundred and forty-seven. I guess he's one hundred and sixty-five now, or something. Yeah, probably. Yeah. For the for the new season, he's like one hundred and sixty-seven, I think. But. Um, <laughs> But still, he's still the professor and he's old. And um, and I thought, well, he would he would be rickety, you know, because they said he's that old. And so I would I would just say, you know, um, you know, I don't want to live on this planet anymore. That's you know, become a meme you, now. That's literally become a meme. I see it everywhere. Oh, All sure. I know. Holy. I know. Good news, everyone. Eh, bad news. The, my, my favorite line from from uh, Farnsworth was when he goes into the tar pit to go younger, and then the the lady's like, "Sir, it's not per, it's not recommended or wise to go naked." He's like, "Oh, you sound like my tennis instructor." I can't do it, but yeah, that's basically. <laughs> <laughs> but that's again, I I have to, you know, talk about the writers. Yeah, how brilliant they've always been. They've always been brilliant. They've always been funny. Um. I think it's so solid and so strong and they are so, so smart, just really, really smart. And I'm always like so pleased, you know, that, uh, you know, it's very seldom that anybody takes the low road. Yeah, but but no, it's really interesting, honestly. And talking to you about all your, your journey and all your amazing characters have been a it's been a dream to talk to you about this. Uh, you know, again, I've, I've admired you since I was a kid. I used to watch your stuff. Oh, man. Since I was a little kid. So I just want to say thanks for coming on today, talking about all the amazing stuff, and uh, hope to stay in touch. And uh, if you're ever in Yeah, Toronto, please, please. We, yeah, we can talk more about, like, as the seasons. There's a couple more seasons coming. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have, I have uh, your representative's uh, contact. I'll get in touch. 
uh, yeah, please. Glenn, Glenn. Yeah, I'll, and I'll next next season we'll have to come back on. We'll, we'll we'll promote it up and we'll talk about it. Yeah, gladly. It's nice to talk to you. Thanks. Hey, and if you're ever in Toronto, let me know. Yeah, you know what? I there could there might be a comic con. I think you know, I've been to Toronto place. to do a comic con before, yeah. and and um, and I'm sure you know because I I try to do as many as I can. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I'm serious. I've met thousands of people and yeah. talked to them and asked them about their lives. And I get into discussions with people, and, you know, and, and then I'm always shocked that people will wait to come up and talk to me because um, I don't want to say, all right, thanks. Hey, you know, rubber stamp everything. And thanks. Have a nice life. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can't do that stuff. I have to, um, you know, I want to I want to embrace them because they've embraced my work and, and, um, you know, I just, I feel like I owe that to everybody. Well, that's very nice of you to say that. Mo most people don't do that. So you're one of the few, honestly, we'll stay in touch. I can't wait uh, to chat again. And honestly, it was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a real pleasure for me too. I really appreciate it. And we will talk. Thanks man. Have a good one. Okay. Take it easy. And there's a final word. Goodbye.